So thank you ever so much for coming to this session and for listening to me talk about animal welfare and its role in the sustainability story. And story is very much the word here. Um, I just wanted to reflect that I started doing this kind of global multi-stakeholder work about five, six years ago. I'd worked in the sector for 15, 20 years. And I went to a conference, a, a, a private conference in Paris of the meat industry. And the response to me being there and talking about animal welfare was some of the US representatives vacated the room and had a whole range of uh, conference calls that they had to do. Um, they didn't want to be part of the discussion. Um, and over time, though, having sat together and having looked at the issue together, we've come to a point where I think we have much more in common than we have in difference. But also, I think we also have much more of the way forward to look at how we communicate and tell a story and reframe this discussion in a way that genuinely reflects sustainability and reflects the value of the livestock sector in delivering the future of food. Um, so hopefully you'll see this from, from that point of view. I should also say that um, on a personal level, and this is not a justification for me being in the room, but on a personal level, I was a vegetarian for 25 years. Um, and in the last five, six years, I've become a meat eater again. And I'm really, really hoping that I'm not responsible for that global rise in meat consumption, because I, <laughs> I have learned to love my steak over that time. So... Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about it. I'm just going to put some ideas in the room and give you a bit of framing around animal welfare. The point of this is to try and give us a start point for a discussion and a, de a debate. I want to hear as much from you in the room as you hear from, from me. Okay. So I want to look at this from the point of view of a consumer, someone who knows nothing about these issues, someone who is standing in the meat aisle in the grocery store trying to figure out what on earth should I buy? I'm just trying to feed my kids this weekend. I need to get the week's shot. What are the messages that I'm hearing in the world? Beef is, beef is bad. I think it's fair to say that I've been in a, a range of different environments. Whether I go and stand in, in supermarkets and listen to what people are saying. I used to do it around the egg aisle because I was looking at cage-free eggs. And I go and just kind of listen to what people are saying. But also... Um, I work quite a bit at the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, and you hear some really interesting conversations in the corridors about how people should reduce meat consumption, how beef is bad, how beef causes cancer, how we should, you know, we should eat more healthily. There's a lot of information out there, even for some of the most informed people, that says that beef is bad for climate change, for environment, for your diet. I'm going to look at this in the wider picture of where we look at beef as, as food. Um, and we do know that fundamentally industrial farming has some major, major issues that it's facing up to in terms of animal welfare. Confinement systems for pigs. We've seen many of the changes and the fact that there is a sea change now for pigs and for, for laying hens around improving from the basic standard systems that have existed for the last 30, 40 years to recognize that animals suffer in those systems and that they need to change to reflect the needs of animals in terms of their behavior as well as their health. So, but these are, these are messages, and some of these messages are real considered science-based evidence messages. I'm an animal welfare science, scientist from Oxford by background, and I can quite comfortably sit there and say the evidence suggests that in many cases industrial farming can cause, confinement systems can cause animals to suffer. I'm not, I'm not widening that to all production, but it's an issue and people hear it. They're hearing that we should be replacing beef with pork or chicken to save the planet. So, so, so what do people do? Do they replace meat completely? I went to a meeting at the Concordia Summit in New York two weeks ago, and there we had um, one, of the chief one of the major executives of Danone talking about how they've just bought plant-based milk company. So that even a, a milk company in and of itself that's based on that is buying the alternatives companies because they know these are, are real challenges, and that might be where some of the market is. So... I see people saying, what do I buy? What do I buy? I need to feed my family, stay healthy. I want safe food, balance the family budget, all good animal welfare, protect the environment, all the things that Crystal raised. So where does animal welfare fit into that picture? So this isn't me telling you what people should think. This is what people tell us they think about it. 
So the Eurobarometer is a European Commission uh, study that looks at representative samples, thousands and thousands of people across all of the European Union states. Um, and it's done repeatedly. It's been done in, in 2005, I think, 2011. And it's done in, again in 2015, published at the start of 2016. And it showed that four in five people want better welfare for farm animals, better than what they have already. And this is the European Union with European legislation, nearly 60% saying they'll pay more for it. Let's jump to China, so a place where information is well controlled, where the systems are new, where everything is changing very quickly. 71% of respondents, and this was a study that, that was conducted looking at pig production, 71% of respondents consider the welfare of animals of importance in their decision making, and 83% want to see production systems that give pigs the freedom to move, not confined. And Three quarters saying they would be willing to pay more. Now that's a big deal in a country where you have a massively urbanizing but also growing economy uh, where people are going to be eating more of that product but have more opportunity to choose. And people now expressing change in terms of, of wanting to choose retailers who provide higher welfare pork. Now the thing that's really interesting for me about this is, is there was a study a few years back and again it showed some of those concerns that we're seeing here. This isn't a, a Western developed issue solely. 50% being concerned about the overuse of antibiotics. 48% describing the bad taste of industrially farmed products. So there's a real issue here about the information people are getting but also the perception that they have of what the product is that they're consuming. Looking at North American research, there's quite a lot of stuff out of North America, and I'm just going to highlight two of the ones that, that are notable. So Norwood and Losk have done a lot of work around consumer choice and, and farm animal welfare. And they showed a study where 69% of those surveyed, and again it was a representative study in this case, believed that farm animals should not suffer. There was interestingly a notable minority who actually didn't care which I shouldn't tell you, but I'm going to be fronting up about all these things. We don't, we're, we're dealing in the real world. Um, a very recent study that looked at young U.S. consumers, and, uh, and I note that because people tried to generalize this, and this is about college students and young U.S. consumers who were given information about different farming systems, saying that factory farmed meat was worth less and people were less willing to buy it. So we have an issue here of how we describe the products that are on the plate and how we describe their components, what, what is in them, how animals have lived to produce them. And David has already talked to us about the Deloitte study, but I think this is really interesting because it does say, and it's this kind of half and half thing of, we know for the vast majority of people, price, taste, convenience, value, in other words, and it's serving its purpose, for food has been key. But one of the biggest issues that goes across the board now is transparency. People want to know what their product is and where it has come from. And they are increasingly concerned, and particularly millennials, um, are increasing, and they're your future consumers, are increasingly concerned about health and wellness, about food safety, but social impact, including animal welfare. So what animal welfare do consumers want? Well, we try and look at it as a, as a pyramid, um, and this kind of represents the scale of production as well. You know, you have a very small number of, of systems um, across the board, across species that produce, that produce animals in very high welfare conditions. The vast majority are still in, in industrialized systems. And here again, I'm talking across species, so don't sit there and hate me and go, no, my farm doesn't look like this. I don't have anything to do with pigs. This is the world of, of industrial production that, that, that we're working in. So gestation crates, sow stalls, banned now in the EU, and the consumer voice is pushing them away, and the choice editing of retailers and fast food chains is moving away from them and moving away from them faster. And I have been overwhelmed and impressed by the scale at which producers have gone, no, we can see the future, and we're not going to do this. We know that certainly in that Norwood and Lusk study, about 1% of people were expressing, that was in the US and, and in, in the EU, it's much higher, expressing a wish to buy high welfare 
so free range, outdoor bread, and so on. And where people have the choice and have the motivation and have the information, then that's something they really are moving towards. But that vast majority are looking for a life worth living for those animals in the production chain. So what does that life worth living mean? Not that they have every creature comfort. I don't have every creature comfort unless I'm at the Fairmont and I'd love to move in and never go away again. And my God, this place is beautiful. Seriously, I wish I'd, so I'd decided to stay longer. No, it's not about every creature comfort. But it is about providing systems that deliver for the behavioral, psychological, as well as physiological needs of those animals. So that may be about freedom. That may be about social grouping. That may be about enrichment. But it's effectively what people out there would probably term natural. How is it to be a pig? How is it to be a chicken? What is it to be a cow? There are things that you need that are fundamental to you, not every single thing, but the things that are fundamental to your life that prevent you from experiencing stress. And I think that's the, the, the concept that people have. People want animals to have a life worth living. They don't want to feel guilty. They don't want to feel bad. They don't want to feel dirty. They don't want to think that their foods come from, come from something that they don't, wouldn't want to touch themselves. And it's that middle ground which is the mainstream. And that's where I think you, as, as producers and as retailers and as fast food manufacturers, all of you, and those who influence, have a huge opportunity to communicate to that middle ground. And it's about going on that journey, moving forward. This is not about saying, let's revolutionize farming, let's tear it up, let's just have the best and eat one chicken leg a month. This is fundamentally about saying, how do we make all the food we eat good? I had a, just as an anecdote, I had a really weird experience about three, four years ago uh, in the UK of um, my son was small and I'd gone traveling, I'd gone out for a day trip with him and um, it was breakfast time on a Sunday and I just went, oh, yeah, God gave me his breakfast because otherwise he's gonna be screaming at me and it's gonna be a hellish day out. Um, where can I get him his breakfast? And realize that actually the only place where I could get food that was humanely raised, readily accessible, um, and I didn't have a whole bunch of money at the time, within my price point, um, and that he'd like and he'd actually eat, was at McDonald's. Because they had cage-free egg muffins. And more recently, I'm quite happy to take my kids there because they have RSPCA-assured uh, uh, sausages and bacon and so on. People wouldn't think McDonald's was the place to go for what you were going to want to eat and what you were going to want to feed your children, maybe. Well, that's about reframing that debate, and I'm quite happy to say that at every turn. So what do consumers, how can consumers decide what to buy? This comes back to the discussion. How do we best provide good information to people, but not just good information. You know, people don't want to read an encyclopedia about the, their meat shelf when they go shopping, they want to feel comfortable. It's about having assurance schemes that you can trust, that you know that they deliver. It's about having labels that people understand and can identify and, and can tack on to, not 27 labels on the packet, which is what you might end up with, um, but that's probably what they're faced with. Increasingly, as Crystal says, it's, a, it's about social media. It's about that deeper information. It's about being able to turn from the shelf to your phone, to, your, to the information. But it's probably also about your Facebook page and your Twitter feed and the bits of communication that are in there. Because I have a, I have a very um, uh, dichotomous Facebook feed. I have everything from the veggie, vegan, environmental side and get all this hideous stuff about how grain to feed beef cattle is being produced on land that has just, basically where Bolivian uh, forests have just been burnt down. And I'm still getting that. I got that the day I left. And at the same time, I'm getting these beautiful stories from the Global Agenda for Sustainable Livestock about what companies are moving towards and about some of these new, new systems. That's my feed. Some people will be, I think there was a thing last week about Facebook's confirmation bias. You hear what you want to hear. Um, so how do we engage with that? People need to trust the brands that they're involved with. And these brand commitments, if you live up to them and you deliver them, raising the bar, as long as you raise the bar far enough, are a surefire way of being able to demonstrate that commitment towards improvement. 
And I think also what it does is it kind of vaccinates you against some of the things that you can't always move forward right on now. People know you're going in the right direction. People know you're committed. And certainly the business benchmark for animal welfare is a really interesting thing to have a look at, bb4.org, where it's an independent survey looking at what companies are doing in terms of policies, reporting, and performance on farm animal welfare. And we've seen a big jump, but it's a big jump from a very, very low base over the last three, four years. But it's worth a look to see how companies are raising the bar, not just in terms of commitments, but in terms of, of action, right through to board level. <coughs> I'm going to just raise this one, um, partly because I'm very proud of it, and I'm also still really surprised of it, with it. In 2007, I used to work for an organization called Compassion in World Farming in the UK as their director of, of um, research and food policy, and I got to set up their food business team for the first time. And we created, um, me and a very small team created the Good Egg Awards. And the point of this was to celebrate companies who were moving to cage-free eggs. Now, this wasn't part of our marketing. We had a tiny, tiny budget and very little time, and I actually went gray in the middle of doing this project, and um, now I have to spend a lot of money on hair dye. Um, but, um, but the thing that was really interesting here is that companies got behind it. McDonald's was one of our first champions, um, one of our first good eggs. Um, Unilever went from being, no, I don't want to engage, to we're transforming our global supply chain. And this was a piece of marketing that they did to talk about their products and their positioning around moving to cage-free eggs. It wasn't earnest. It wasn't information. We're good guys because we're doing this. And the reason I mention this now, because this is old news, it's 2007, is because we're seeing this specific move on cage-free eggs roll through Europe, roll through North America, roll into Asia, and this is where it's going. And this is cage-free eggs, and everything else is going to go the same way. Animal welfare is not a point of contention, and maybe shall we have it's fundamentally part of the picture. And so I'm just going to move back to cattle. Why do we have a problem? Maybe we have a problem because the image in people's heads is that feedlot that I showed you in the first place. I just pulled that. I, I actively just pulled that off the Internet because that's what people see. I had the opportunity to go and see Silver Pastoral Systems in Colombia as part of a project where we were looking at the economics, the productivity, the environmental impact, and animal welfare together and building a strong evidence base. That's why you've got a nice little graph here. Um, but by God, this is one of the most photogenic cows in the world. Um, and it was beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And they have managed through... Um, delivering systems that, that have all these components through silver pastoral systems to increase their productivity tenfold and to move from loss to profitability in the long term. So there are good stories to tell here. I think the challenge you're going to have is, well, there are still bad stories to be told. That's going to taint everybody. So raising that bar to a point where everyone can feel comfortable and it matches people's concerns is going to be really key. So how do consumers decide? Who do you trust? Do you trust your friends who've sent you a link? Do you trust the press? Do you trust brand communications? Generally, I think people often say no. Do you trust third parties? Often we as NGOs um, will be seen as arbiters. Do you trust no one and just put your hand over your eyes and reach out for the soy milk? So what can we do? We've talked about assurance, transparency, labels, information. We need to attend to consumers' concerns. Consumers genuinely are concerned. Those concerns are not going to go away. We can help people understand how to engage with them, but they're not going to go away. Raising that bar and having clarity of commitments and celebrating those is really key. And having those allies to stand around you and celebrate what you've done. Telling stories, we've talked about that a little bit this morning, but provenance really plays out. You guys have incredible stories to, to, to tell. And I think this piece of reframing the debate is fundamental. Now, I wrote down three words that inspired by David this morning. One adjective, I think, and two verbs. I had to go and check, to check it was an adjective. Um, the first is responsible. We're responsible for our animals. We're responsible for our place in society. We're responsible for the consequences of what we do. Two verbs. We deliver. 
We don't just have ideas. We don't just have nice words. We deliver this. But thirdly, we advocate for it. If we are the solution, what I worry about is that you'll be dragged along, pulled along someone else's discussion. If you genuinely are doing these things, be proud of them, speak up and stand up, but make sure it's not greenwashing because people will pull that rug out from underneath you within seconds. Um, and I had the luxury of going on the, the farm tour yesterday, um, but I think these are your ambassadors. Um, I only know one's name. This is Ambush. And he ambushed me. He scared the living daylights out of me yesterday um, and made everybody else laugh at me and make me look like an idiot and not someone who'd ever been around a cow before. Um, but no, he, you know, these, these guys, the, particularly the pasture, the scenery, the fact you're on grass, the fact that you're using virtually no inputs in terms of things that are going to impact on the world, these are, they, they, this is a hell of a story to tell. Um, so... I'll leave you with, with these guys, but hopefully it provokes the start of a discussion, and I think we're all going, hopefully, in the same direction. If not, you probably have some lunch left you can throw at me.